will lab-grown milk could be on the supermarket shelves by 2024. The animal-free product promises to have a near-identical taste and nutritional content to milk, but will be more sustainable than traditional dairy farming. Joining me live is Jim Fader, CEO of Eden Brew. Talk us through how this is created, and let's just dumb the science down a little bit maybe, but essentially it's um, using in part what the protein of milk to try to mimic the product. Hi, Tom. Yes, that's right. We use the yeast to brew proteins uh, and then we take those proteins and they're nature identical, just like um, what forms in the cow's tummy. And we bind it up with all the nutrition, uh, again, the same nutrition that's found in milk and it tangles up the same way it does in nature and voila, you have milk without the cow. So in terms of nutritional, we know dairy is really important to get to um, older Australians, kids as well no reduced benefit at all if you had this product versus actual milk? None whatsoever. I mean, there are many benefits to this product. For example, it's lactose free, so it's, it's low allergen, rules out most of the dairy allergens that consumers face into. Uh, and then of course, it's a little bit cleaner too. It doesn't come from the animal. It's brewed in a very clean environment. So um, it's got a longer shelf life, which again, will turn into uh, more benefits for budget consumers as um, milk doesn't hit its use by data soon. Near identical is the line being used. So how is it different or would you struggle in a, in a taste test, a cold glass side to side? Uh, look, I think there's there's a couple of things that uh, our research says, uh, and I'm a big dairy lover, right, but um, that customers say are really important to them about consuming dairy products. And the first is it's sensory, and the second is it's nutrition, and we won't compromise on either. We've made uh, batch productions, we've tasted it, we can't tell the difference. It's uh, um, because you start with those nature-identical proteins and then you make it up the same way um, via what's called a casein micelle, tangles that nutrition together and makes it bioavailable just the way nature intended. So is that your sort of party trick? If someone's coming along and you're after a grant or an investor, you say, here's a taste test, one's milk, one's my product, see if you know the difference? Uh, we certainly uh, will do plenty of that. There's going to be lots of blind taste testing and lots of opportunity for customers to trip up and choose the wrong one because they're not going to be able to tell the difference. All right, that's confident. I'm sure journos will enjoy doing that. Um, <laughs> cost, what's mentioned today is cost. At the moment, it's obviously, I'm assuming it's quite expensive. You want to get a scale up and you're thinking it might be similar to, to milk by the end of the decade, but that's only assuming milk actually goes up in price. So compared to today's dairy, does that mean it is more expensive and even at scale it will be more expensive? Well, we're going to uh, we're going to appeal to both dairy drinkers and dairy avoiders because we've got that dairy sensory and nutrition. Uh, but um, we also um, tick the boxes as to why people avoid dairy. That's either lactose intolerance concerns about animals or um, the environment. So we'll appeal to both. When we launch in two years, we'll launch at around about $4.50 to $5 a litre. So it's expensive versus cheapest milk on display, but around the same price as almond and oat milks in the category. But then with the benefit of a longer shelf life, and perhaps because we appeal to many different milk drinkers, maybe you need less different types of milk in your fridge um, and, and our milk would, would suit more customers' needs. The big thing here, though, is that um, as we are brewing our milk at greater and greater scale, the cost comes, comes down significantly over the next couple of years, and we will be the same price as dairy milk on sale in supermarkets by 2028. Right, but that, that would be assuming dairy ticks up a bit with demand and so on. That, that's your assumption there when you say same price? We've assumed about 5% inflation in those numbers. Even if inflation okay. in dairy is lower than that, the, the, the crossover is, is uh, at a similar point. Okay. So the point for a lot of people is this being better for the environment. Is that the case just yet? I know there are studies out there suggesting it's n it very much depends on the type of power you're using and our current power mix in Australia wouldn't make it better. What's your uh, explanation on that? I think to do an environmental study, you've got to consider a lot of different things. Certainly, renewable energy will be a very important part of our overall environmental study uh, to ensure we're as optimised as we can be. Uh, but we use a fraction of the water, a fraction of the land. Um, there's no methane emissions from animals and no uh, pollution into the water system. So there's no study out there that suggests when you consider all those factors um, that we're not uh, a far better environment and carbon footprint print.
But to really kick goals there, it needs to be, you know, would you need to hook up to maybe a renewable power source wherever this is based? Uh, absolutely. I think renewable um, renewable energy, and in fact, uh, as virtuous a solution, every step along the supply chain as you can is what's most important. All businesses should be doing that as part of their ESG uh, approach these days anyway. Uh, we certainly will be doing that. All right. Well, who knows? Coming to a shelf near you perhaps uh, soon enough in a couple of years, I, I, I'm intrigued. I will do the taste test. Jim Fader, thanks for your time today. Thank you very much, Tom.